Hi everyone, let's talk about third-party rights and discharge. In this section, we'll describe assignment and delegation regarding contracts. We'll define what a third-party beneficiary is. We'll examine unconditional versus conditional promises to perform. We'll distinguish between conditions precedent, conditions subsequent, and concurrent conditions. We'll explain when the performance of a contract is discharged, and we'll define statute of limitations and explain how it applies to contract disputes. So getting started, uh, the parties that are involved in a contract, the original two or more parties that are stated in the contract are said to be in privity of contract. If you're in privity, you have rights to enforce. And if somebody breaches, you have rights to sue uh, the breaching party. Uh, anybody outside of that is considered to be a third party or an outside party. Uh, that is a person who may in some way be affected by a contract, but who is not one of the contracting parties. The general rule is that third parties do not acquire any rights under other people's contracts. And then a big part of this uh, lesson is on the exceptions to that rule. Uh, in which instances would a third party actually have rights under another person's contract. Uh, so the two big exceptions there are assignees, uh, people to whom rights are transferred under a contract, and intended third party beneficiaries. So first let's look at assignment. An assignment in a contract is the transfer of a contractual right uh, by one party to another party. Uh, and looking at a little bit of vocabulary, uh, the assignor is a party who transfers a right. They transfer the right to the assignee, who is the party to whom the right is transferred. Uh, an obligor is a person who owes a duty of performance under a contract. And an obligee is a party who is owed a right under a contract. So let's illustrate uh, what that would look like. So here we have a contract, the original contract, is that there is a creditor who is loaning money to a debtor. Uh, the creditor would also be known as the obligee. Uh, the debtor would be known as the obligor. The debtor owes an obligation to pay back the loan. Uh, they signed a promissory note to pay back the loan in installments. Uh, they're going to pay that money back to the creditor who is the obligee. Now that's the original contract. So where the third party comes into play is, let's say uh, the creditor is a bank and the bank takes that promissory note. Let's assume it's a mortgage loan. Uh, so somebody's buying a house. So they own a mortgage loan uh, and they have the right to receive those mortgage payments from the debtor. So the bank sells that mortgage note to another bank. Uh, so they are going to assign that note over to the third party uh, and once it's been um, executed, once the assignment has been made official, now the assignee, the third party bank, has the right to enforce payment of that note. So they will have to notify the debtor uh, that the note has been transferred or assigned, uh, and then now they have to pay the third party rather than the original bank. So uh, right, there are some rights that cannot be assigned under a contract. Uh, if you want to be sure that rights under a contract aren't assigned. You'll want to include that language in the contract. But let's look at things that courts generally don't think can be assigned. Uh, so one of those is a personal service contract. If it's very important that a specific person uh, be the one that performs, um, then courts will generally say that that uh, can't be assigned. So, you know, if I'm hiring a, um, an artist to paint my portrait, and I'll use this example a couple of times. Uh, and I hire that person specifically because of uh, their, um, their specific skills. Then let's say that they shouldn't be able to assign that right to somebody else. Uh, I also can't assign a future right. So let's say that I think that uh, in the future, my parents are going to uh, write me into their will and I'll get a lot of money from them when they die. Uh, that would be a future right that I have if I'm in their will, <clears throat> but I wouldn't be able to sign that future right uh, to anybody else because who knows what could happen between now and then. My parents could get angry. They could write me out of the will. Uh, they might not have any money left. Who knows? So I can't assign that future right. Uh, if there's a contract where an assignment would materially 
alter the risk. So you could think of this, an easy example would be an insurance contract. So um, if I have a car insurance contract and then my child turns 16, uh, I couldn't assign that contract to them because the risk of a 16 year old kid driving is much higher than the rights or than the risk of a 40 year old man like myself uh, who's never been involved in a major accident. And then finally, assignment of legal action. If I have the right to sue somebody, um, then I can't assign that right to sue somebody to somebody else. That's the general rule anyways. Okay, so what's the effect once a right has been assigned? So the assignee would then be entitled to performance from the obliger. And the unconditional assignment of a contract right extinguishes all of the assigner's rights. To protect their rights, the assignee should immediately notify the obliger that the assignment has been made and performance must be rendered to the assignee. So in our bank example earlier, uh, once that promissory note, the mortgage loan has been uh, assigned over to the third party bank, the third party bank needs to notify the obligor that payments need to be made to the third party bank and not to the original bank. Uh, otherwise, we have a situation in which you know, I'm, I'm paying my mortgage and I think I'm paying it to the right person, but in reality, a third party bank had uh, bought the loan, but I didn't know about it, so I'm making payment to the wrong person. We have a mess on our hands. So um, the assignee should notify the obliger uh, that they need to be making payments to them instead. And like I mentioned earlier, uh, you can include in a contract an anti-assignment clause saying that rights under the contract cannot be assigned, and that would prevent that from happening. An approval clause in a contract permits the assignment of the contract only upon receipt of an obliger's approval. Now this happens sometimes in lease contracts where uh, it might say in the contract that I can't um, assign my right to the, if I'm leasing an apartment for instance. There might be a provision in there saying that I can't um, you know, sublease the apartment to somebody else without the approval uh, of the apartment uh, rental company. So if I was to not need the apartment anymore and I wanted to sublease it to a friend to finish out the, the remainder of my lease, I would have to go get the approval of the um, rental company first. And that makes sense because they don't want just anybody coming in there. They're going to probably run a credit check and a background check just to make sure they're not going to tear up their property. Uh, so that's an approval clause. And then what about it if there are successive assignments? So in our loan um, example, the third party bank buys the mortgage loan um, and they could sell it to another bank who could sell it to another bank who could sell it to another bank. Um, and, you know, if we're not being careful, successive assignments could be made where two people think they have the right um, to some type of contract or some type of payments. And then we have to decide, well, uh, who actually has rights to collect payment? The American rule, also known as the New York rule, is that the first assignment in time prevails. So whoever can prove that the assignment was made to them first would prevail. Um, so that's the one that's generally enforced in the United States. It can vary a little from state to state, but the majority of states enforce the American rule. Uh, the English rule is that the first uh, assignee to give notice to the obliger is the one that gets the rights. Um, and then some places have a possession of a tangible token rule. If there is some type of tangible token associated with the sale, like maybe a stock certificate or something like that, um, then the first person who receives that tangible token would prevail. So that's assignment. Um, delegation is a very similar concept. Instead of transferring a right under a contract, we're transferring a duty under a contract. So delegation of duties is a transfer of contractual duties by the obliger to another party for performance. And then the vocabulary associated here is the delegator, is the obliger who transfers his or her duty. And the delegatee is a party to whom the duty has been transferred. So in this example, we have an original contract, contract number one, where a promisor or the obliger uh, promises to perform some act for the promisee or the obligee. And let's say that this is, for the sake of example, this is a contract to mow somebody's lawn. So um, the promisor is promising to go uh, mow the promisee's yard. 
uh, and let's say later on they decide they either don't want to do it or they don't have time to do it. So instead of performing it themselves, they delegate that duty uh, to the third party, to the delegatee. Uh, so then it would be the delegatee's obligation to then go perform for the promisee. The promisee would then have to also pay the delegatee. Some duties cannot be delegated. It'll be similar to an assignment where uh, things that involve um, the performance of a specific person uh, can't be delegated. So uh, like we see here, when the obligee has a substantial interest in specific obliger performing the acts under contract. So I really need the performance of a specific person. Um, then generally those duties cannot be delegated. Uh, so that includes personal service contracts calling for the exercise of personal skills, discretion, or expertise, uh, or contracts whose performance would materially vary if duties were delegated. Basically, if I can convince a court that uh, the delegation of performance to another person would substantially change uh, the quality or the performance of the work, um, then that duty generally cannot be delegated to somebody else. However, a lot of times what we're doing with our companies rather than individual people. So if I have a contract with a company rather than an individual, individual person, it would be okay for that company, even if I'm dealing with a salesman or if I'm dealing with a, like a master carpenter or something like that who works for the company, um, it would be okay for that company to delegate those duties to qualified employees. So we're specific to say qualified employees because if there was a question later, we would have to show that the uh, person to whom the duties were delegated was actually qualified to perform that work. The liability of the delegatee. So when things go wrong, there's often questions about liability. Who can sue whom? Who owes money to whom? Uh, so that's what we're dealing with here. Um, and there's a couple rules. One is uh, assumption of the duties, uh, where a valid delegation of duties contains the term assumption the delegatee would be legally liable to the obligee for non-performance. However, if we don't have that language, then it's considered to be a declaration of duties uh, where there's a valid delegation of duties, but the delegatee has not assumed the duties under a contract. And then the delegatee would not be liable to the obligee for non-performance. Again, this only arises when there's some dispute or breach of the contract and we have to figure out who's going to sue whom and who owes money to whom. Uh, in either one of these forms, the delegator, the original party, uh, remains liable to the obligee. For that reason, in a lot of modern contracts, we don't see this type of delegation happen because there's too many parties on the hook. I mean, it does happen sometimes, but generally the better idea is if I need to delegate a duty to somebody else, we might just terminate one contract and create another contract naming the third party. Um, just to avoid some of the complication. If I want to be sure in my contract that the original party can't delegate some duty to a third party, I want to include an anti-delegation clause saying that duties under this contract cannot be delegated to a third party, or at least I have to approve before those duties can be delegated to somebody else. Um, assignment and delegation occurs when there's a transfer of both rights and duties under a contract. And that's pretty common. Um, you know, if you're transferring a duty for somebody else to mow my lawn, then I would also have the, um, they would also have the right to collect money from me. So it would be the transfer of a duty and a right at the same time, assignment and delegation. So we take uh, third party beneficiaries and we divide them up into two groups. A Third party beneficiary is somebody who benefits under a contract, but who uh, either may or may not be named in the contract, but they're not one of the original two parties involved in the contract. So an intended beneficiary, um, the contract was designed to benefit them. They might even be named in the contract. Uh, and then so if somebody breaches, they can enforce the contract. They can sue, to, sue for breach or they can sue to enforce the contract, even though they aren't in what we call privity of contract. Uh, there are some exceptions to that, but this is the main rule. On the other hand, an incidental beneficiary is somebody who would stand to benefit from a contract, but 
uh, it wasn't intended. It was incidental. Uh, and thus, they have no legal right to enforce the contract. So an example here of an incidental beneficiary would be, um, let's say that the house that I used to own was really near uptown. Uh, and I could walk to Panther Stadium from there. And uh, let's say the Panthers were involved in, in this big expensive contract to build a new stadium and attract a lot of new people there. And so I thought that was going to benefit me because I was planning on airbnb my house out uh, to rent it to people who are going to come to games. But then let's say the contract, somebody breaches the contract, they don't build a new stadium, they in fact demolish the original stadium, and now my house is no longer within walking distance and I'm not going to benefit anymore. I would not have the legal right to sue because I was not an intended beneficiary. Any, any benefit from that contract I was going to get was been, would have been purely incidental, uh, and so I wouldn't be able to do anything about it. In this case, we're going to have to decide whether or not somebody is an intended beneficiary of a contract. So here are the facts. Colby Hormuth uh, has a provisional driver's license and is driving with his grandmother, Bernice, who is supervising him driving. Colby makes a left turn onto a street and is struck, behind, uh, struck from behind by a motorcycle driven by Klein. Klein is severely injured in this accident. The collision report from the police says that Colby caused the accident. Klein's attorney sues and makes a demand for uh, the auto insurance policy limit of $100,000, which the insurance company pays. But part of that deal for the insurance company paying is that Klein has to sign a release agreement releasing the driver, his parents, and quote, any other person, corporation, association, or partnership responsible in any manner or degree unquote, uh, from any further liability for the accident. Klein later sues Bernice for negligent supervision, trying to get some extra money out of this. Bernice defends, arguing that she was an intended beneficiary of the release agreement that Klein signed. Klein says that he, he further says that he wouldn't have even signed the release if he knew it released Bernice as well. The trial court awards summary judgment to Bernice, Klein appeals. So it goes to the appellate court and the issue at hand is, was Bernice uh, Hormuth an intended beneficiary of the release signed by Klein? So the language of the court um, says that the language of the release unambiguously expresses a mutual intent to benefit a class of persons of which Bernice Hormuth is a member. Thus, she is entitled to enforce the release. Klein reads the release language to only cover named parties. However, the court disagrees. So Bernice wins and is not liable for any further damages as a result of that accident. So there are two uh, types of major types of intended third party beneficiaries. Those are donee beneficiaries and creditor beneficiaries. Uh, a donee beneficiary uh, is someone to whom um, a benefit or gift is going to be conferred um, so the contract by its nature intends to benefit them in some way even though they're not doing they don't owe any duty under the contract they're basically getting a gift or some kind of benefit without having to do anything um, so the donee beneficiary is that third party who is going to benefit an example of this the most common example of this um, is let's say john goes out and takes out a one million dollar life insurance policy and names his wife as the beneficiary. So if he dies, his wife would get the $1 million on the policy. If John dies, and if the insurance company doesn't pay, the wife would have the right to sue to enforce the contract. Even though she was not uh, privy to the original contract, she was a named intended beneficiary and would have rights to enforce it. This is just illustrating what I just said. So we have an insured person who buys a life insurance policy from a company who is a promisor. Um, his wife is named in the contract as a beneficiary, thus she is an intended beneficiary and would thus have the rights to enforce if the life insurance company breaches. A creditor beneficiary um, is a creditor who becomes a beneficiary under the debtor's new contract 
with another party. So this happens when a debtor borrows money, the debtor signs an agreement to pay back the money plus interest, the debtor sells the item to a third party before the loan is paid off, and then the third party promises the debtor that he or she will pay the remainder of the loan to the creditor. So an example of this, let's say this contract is for um, the purchase of a car. Uh, so <clears throat> the first buyer buys a car and to pay for it, he takes out a loan from a bank. This would be contract number one, taking out a loan. Uh, the bank is the creditor. The buyer is the debtor. The debtor is agreeing to pay on a promissory note uh, to pay back that loan to the original creditor. Uh, now let's say that the uh, buyer, the debtor, sells that car to somebody else. Um, there's still some money owed on the car. The second buyer would have to then agree um, to pay the creditor in place of the first buyer. So rather than the first buyer continuing to make payments, they sell the car uh, to the second buyer. The second buyer then agrees to keep making payments on that loan. So this is a creditor beneficiary contract. This is not generally a good idea to do because if the second buyer doesn't make payments, then uh, the creditor could come back and sue the first buyer as well. So the better thing to do, the more common thing to do is pay off that first loan, uh, extinguish that contract completely, uh, and then the second buyer would take out another loan uh, and have their own original contract with the creditor. So that's generally how things are done. But if you don't do it that way, both parties here could still be liable uh, if somebody doesn't make a payment. So in this uh, case, we're going to examine again whether or not some parties are intended beneficiaries who can enforce a contract. The facts of the case are that Walmart develops a code of contract for its foreign suppliers. So Walmart's buying a lot of supplies from uh, foreign manufacturers um, and is under pressure uh, from the United States population to um, have at least some standards for the way that those suppliers treat their workers. Um, so they develop these, uh, this document called Standards for Suppliers. Uh, the standards require the suppliers to adhere to local law, local law being in their country, and local industry working conditions regarding pay, forced labor, child labor, discrimination in the workplace, etc. A lot of workers band together from several countries and they sue Walmart, claiming that they are intended third-party beneficiaries of the contract between Walmart and the suppliers, that their employers are regularly violating the standards Walmart established, and that Walmart is failing to investigate and enforce those standards. The issue here is, are the foreign workers intended third-party beneficiaries under Walmart's contracts with its foreign suppliers? Well, the workers certainly seem so. Um, but Walmart is going to defend saying that the contract is between Walmart and the suppliers, not Walmart and the workers. So Walmart is going to try to get this case dismissed. So let's look at what the court says. The U.S. Court of Appeals holds that foreign workers are not intended third party beneficiaries and thus cannot sue Walmart. They said, quote, the language of the standards does not create a duty on the part of Walmart to monitor the suppliers and does not provide plaintiffs a right of action against Walmart as third party beneficiaries. Plaintiff's allegations are insufficient to support the conclusion that Walmart and the suppliers intended for plaintiffs to have a right of performance, I misspelled performance there, uh, against Walmart under the supply contracts. A covenant is, we're looking at some vocabulary here, but a covenant is an unconditional promise to perform. Most provisions in contracts are covenants, and once I make that unconditional promise to perform, uh, then I'm bound to it. Non-performance is breach of contract that gives the other party the right to sue. But what if I do put some conditions on it? Okay, there's a lot of different ways I can put a condition on a promise or on a covenant. Um, so those are oftentimes indicated by language such as if, or on the condition that, or provided that, or when and after. These are all words that would lead us to believe that some kind of condition is being placed on a promise. We take conditions and divide them up into three categories. Conditions precedent, subsequent, and concurrent. 
So let's look at those three. A condition precedent means that something has to happen before a party is obligated to perform. Something has to happen before. So something that precedes something is something that happens before. Uh, an example would be Google offers Jane, who is a college senior, a job at Google on the condition that she graduates first. So as long as she graduates, she'll have a job. If she doesn't, uh, if she doesn't graduate, Google is not obligated to give her a job because she didn't meet the condition precedent. If Jane does graduate, but Google then refuses to hire her, uh, she can sue because she met the condition, uh, but Google breached the contract. Uh, sometimes we place conditions precedent based on satisfaction. This would be a contract that allows a party to reserve payment until the products or services meet the buyer's quote satisfaction. And satisfaction can be defined in, in many different ways and interpreted pretty broadly. So courts have developed two satisfaction tests. One is a personal satisfaction test, which is very subjective and gives a lot of power to the buyer. Um, so let's say that I hire an artist to paint my portrait and uh, I put in the contract that I can reserve payment until I am personally satisfied with their work. So if they paint the portrait and if I don't like it, I can reject it and not pay. So, you know, if you're an artist, it's a good idea for you to structure your contracts such that uh, you have a little bit more assurance of payment. Maybe you get a deposit first. Um, maybe you exclude this satisfaction test. You know, you might have to cover yourself there a little bit. Um, but it, again, it's a subjective test um, that involves personal taste and comfort. Um, so, you know, if you're performing this contract, you really have to be sure to check in um, with your client to make sure that they're satisfied along the way so that you don't get stuck doing a lot of work and not getting paid. Uh, the other test is a reasonable person test. This is uh, an objective test that applies to commercial contracts and contracts involving mechanical fitness. Uh, so an example could be that I order a shipment of bananas. Um, there are some industry standards regarding size, color, quality, and the bananas all meet those um, standards. So I wouldn't be able to reject them because a reasonable produce company would accept them. So uh, I can do something that a reasonable person wouldn't do. A reasonable person would accept. I have to accept as long as they meet those objective standards. Another uh, version of a condition precedent would be time. So a lot of contracts include a time for performance. Performance has to happen by X date, otherwise I'm not paying, something like that. Um, and generally a failure to perform by the contract date is considered to be a breach. But when courts go in to interpret it, they might look and see, well, you know, did any damages really result from the breach? Was there significant injury? There was a lot of monetary loss. And if there was not, the court might treat that delay as being a minor breach and give the other party additional time to perform. If I don't want this to happen, if I need time to happen definitely by some date, I can include contract language like time is of the essence. That's the most common phrase for indicating this, saying that performance has to happen by X date or um, or I'm not going to pay. Um, and generally no additional time is going to be granted. You know, The only exception might be if the court goes in and says I included that phrase without time really being of the essence, if I can't prove that I would actually suffer some type of injury, maybe they would allow additional time, but it's going to be harder if I have that phrase in there. A condition subsequent. So if a condition precedent is something that has to happen before, a condition subsequent is something that would happen after. Um, so here parties agree that the contract will be terminated when a prescribed event occurs or does not occur. Uh, a lot of us have conditions subsequent placed on our employment. Uh, a very common form might be that an employment contract providing that the contract can be terminated if the employee fails a drug test at any point. Even though I have an employee contract, employment contract and I'm working for them, um, if later on they do a random drug test and I fail, they could terminate that contract. A concurrent condition uh, is something that has to happen at the same time. This is pretty common, uh, especially when we have contracts where um, payment is due on delivery. 
Okay, so that'd be pretty common. Um, once the products are delivered, then payment is due right then. They have to happen at the same time. Express conditions exist when the party expressly agree on those terms, generally written down in the contract language, so it's easy to tell what's expressed. There are some implied, uh, implied in fact, con uh, conditions that can be uh, part of a contract. Those would be based on the circumstances surrounding the contract and the conduct of the parties involved. So uh, an example might be if I have a contract to buy a um, certain number of barrels of oil, um, the contract might only say, you know, the sale and the price and the time. Uh, but there are some implied conditions saying that, well, whoever I'm buying them from, whoever I'm buying the oil from has adequate facilities to store. Uh, they have adequate facilities for me to actually go and pick up that oil, to load and unload, uh, and access the storage site. Those, so those are all things that would be implied uh, as part of the contract. So when can performance of a contract be discharged? Um, well, it can happen by agreement, it can happen by impossibility, and, and then a lot of contracts include what we call force majeure clauses. So let's look at all those. Uh, discharge by agreement means that the parties mutually agree to discharge or end their contractual duties. Um, so this can happen through mutual rescission where both parties just get together and agree that we're going to terminate this contract, we're going to rescind it, neither party has a duty to perform any longer, and if we both agree on it, that's fine. Um, we could also substitute the contract for another one, saying that, well, this contract doesn't make sense anymore, so let's execute a new contract. Um, with new dates or new prices or something like that. And if both parties agree, then again, that's fine. Uh, a novation would be if we substitute one party for another party. Uh, so we could terminate one party, uh, form another contract naming a new party who's going to perform now instead of the original party. Uh, and that would relieve uh, the exiting party of liability on that contract. Finally, we have accord and satisfaction. We've talked about this uh, a little bit before, but let's say I have a credit card, uh, outstanding credit card debt, um, and let's say it goes significantly overdue and they sell that to a um, collections company. The collections company now has the right to come back and try to collect that credit card debt. Um, but if I can't pay it all, I might be able to strike some kind of deal with them and say, well, I owe 10,000, but I can only pay 5,000, and if you'll accept 5,000, um, then let's have an accord and satisfaction saying we'll discharge the remaining debt if I pay the 5,000. So again, if both parties agree to it, um, then that would be fine. Discharge of performance can also happen through objective impossibility, meaning that's no longer possible to perform. This can happen in a couple different ways. Um, one, uh, one party could die or become incapacitated prior to performance of the contract. So, you know, if I hire my artist to paint my portrait, but the artist dies before performance, um, they're obviously no longer required to perform because they can't, and I have no obligation to make any kind of payment. Uh, the subject matter could also be destroyed. Um, so let's say, example, I'm renting a warehouse to store some of my goods, but the warehouse burns down. I'm probably going to be released from making any further lease payments on that. That's generally so. Um, I do have to check the language of the contract to be sure about that. Um, we could also have supervening illegality. Um, so we had a contract that was originally valid, but then after that, um, something about it becomes illegal. So I can no longer perform for that reason. So, uh, you know, modern context, let's say I have a contract to purchase N95 mask from China for a hospital in North Carolina, but the federal government subsequently makes purchasing masks from China illegal before I can get them. So I can't buy them and the hospital gets mad at me because I said I was going to buy them, but I can't. So they sue me, but I, I can go back and say, well, it would be illegal for me to buy them from China. So how could I be expected to do so? Uh, and the court would most likely discharge me from that duty to buy those masks. A force majeure clause. Um, a lot of times we just call these acts of God, uh, but it's a clause in a contract where we name uh, specific types of events that could excuse non-performance. So if a flood happened or an earthquake or a tornado or a riot or a war, um, those are things that might excuse performance of a party um, 
And, you know, put in a modern context, again, we're dealing with the COVID crisis right now. Um, so if you're hearing this in future years, we have to remember back to the COVID crisis. It's a pretty big deal. I think everybody will remember it. Um, but so we have had these um, instances in which, let's say, a business uh, has been forced to shut down by the government. So they shut down and then there are, a question arises whether or not they still have to make lease payments. So they go to the insurance company and say, well, um, we think we're going to file an insurance claim because we can't make lease payments because we can't uh, conduct business. And so they're hoping insurance is going to pay and help cover the lease or, you know, whatever costs there that are associated. But then what they're finding is that in the insurance contracts, there's a force majeure clause that names pandemics um, as being excluded, saying, well, um, if a pandemic happens, that's not something you can file a claim for. We would be, uh, the insurance company would be um, excused from performance. They would be discharged from performance and paying out uh, if it's a pandemic. So it's putting businesses in a pretty tight spot there. Um, so that's one reason why it's very, very important to read the language of the contract to understand what's covered, what are the expectations of me, what are the expectations of the other party, uh, where are there instances in which performance might be um, discharged. Finally, uh, the last thing here is the statute of limitations. So performance could be discharged if um, a certain amount of time passes. Um, so if somebody, uh, you know, let somebody, for example, let's say somebody breaches a contract uh, and then the other party is going to sue for breach of contract. But then let's also say North Carolina statute of limitations on breach of contract might be three or five years, depending on the type of contract we're dealing with. So if that time period elapses, if let's say the statute of limitations on this specific contract was three years, if three years goes by and I haven't brought that lawsuit yet, then uh, I can still try to bring it, but the other party will be able to defend saying that the statute of limitations has passed. I can no longer enforce that contract uh, because I didn't bring it within the specific time period and I lose the right to sue. So that wraps us up for this chapter. Hope you all have a good one.